And let's say hi to Jessica. Thank you. So first, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors on this project, Dr. Robert McCarthy, um, who also has the prestigious title of the biggest pain in my rear end. Um, <laughs> so he's here today, <laughs> right back there. <laughs> um, He's wonderful to work with, really. <laughs> uh, we've also worked with um, Dr. Stephen Levine and Dr. Michael Reed. Dr. McCarthy is a small animal surgeon uh, at the Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Levine is, is a um, computer engineer, and Dr. Reed is a biologist. So we wouldn't all be sitting here today, I think, if feral cats um, didn't pose some sort of a um, detriment to the environment. Um, so we know that feral cats have caused appreciable declines in populations of birds, small mammals, and reptiles that are already threatened or endangered. And they also tend to carry more zoonotic infections than our owned outdoor, anim our owned outdoor cats or dogs. Um, and they also just affect the health of our domestic animals. So they pose a significant risk to native wildlife, other out, outdoor animals, um, and our domestic animals. So multiple methods have been proposed to control these feral cat populations. One of them is obviously non-surgical methods of control like we're talking about today. Um, and then we've got surgical methods of control like trap neuter release, and less commonly, trap vasectomy hysterectomy release. So we, and then of course there's lethal, lethal control and removal from populations. And so this is important because oftentimes these programs are run by people who are individually funding these programs or they're run by nonprofit organizations. So the appropriate use of the finite resources that these people who are volunteering their time provide is very critical. So for these reasons, we, <laughs> we wanted to find out... Um, we wanted to find out when during the year specifically you should provide these interventions to make to have the maximum effect on population size while also reducing the number of resources that are used. So we thought that cats in temperate zones are seasonal breeders, we know that, um, and so the time of year a control program is applied will have different effects on the population size. And so Similar to our last presenter, we've used an individual-based stochastic simulation model that was previously used to compare the effectiveness of each method of control. So trap neuter release, trap vasectomy hyster hysterectomy release, and lethal control. And that study was also done by McCarthy, Reed, and Levine. And so with this, um, individual-based stochastic simulation model, we want to get as much of the relevant biologic parameters as possible because these models simulate the, um, take into consideration the behavior of individuals within the population to get the whole behavior of the entire population. Um, so we have used reproductive parameters, societal parameters, and vital rate parameters in our study. Um, we won't go into re reproductive parameters or societal parameters, but I will go into uh, further detail on those vital rate parameters because those are pretty important. Um, the other parameters are obviously important too, but um, just in the interest of time, I won't go over that. So with vital rate parameters, it's important to recognize that in a population of cats that have undergone control, there are a number of different classes of cats within the population. Each of those classes has a different, like, different likelihood of daily survival. So we know that the predicted daily survival of kittens is less than adults, and that makes sense. The predicted daily survival of kittens will also increase after neutering. And less commonly known is that the predicted sur daily survival of kittens and young juveniles within a population increases as a greater percentage of the population is neutered. And this was um, looked at by Gunther and others in 2011, and they found that 32% of kittens survived to six months of age in colonies with no intervention. But 76% of kittens survived to six months of age in matched colonies 
after 75% of that population was neutered. So within our study, we've included a parameter called the B value, and that represents kitten survival rate. So B equals zero is no effect, and B equals 0 0.6 is a moderate effect of kitten survival on the population. We also know that density-dependent effects are at play in feral cat populations, just like with any population of wildlife, and the predicted daily survival of an individual will decrease as the population reaches its carrying capacity. So for model inputs, we have looked at a population of 200 cats over the course of 6,000 days, where the first 2,000 days are just a burn-in period for the population to reach a steady state. We look at um, a yearly trapping program that happens over the course of 30 days, and within that 30-day period, between 0 and 97% of a cat pop feral cat population is trapped. We look at seasons from early winter to late fall, um, and we have not included immigration or emigration in this model, as well as pseudo-pregnant and pregnant cats in our treatment groups. Um, and the reason we have excluded the treatment of pregnant and pseudo-pregnant cats is mainly because a lot of programs just choose not to treat those animals because they're difficult to distinguish. Um, and so that's, that's our primary reason for excluding that group. But we've also included the treatment of kittens beginning at 42 days of age, and then we look at trap neuter release, trap removal and lethal control versus trap vasectomy hysterectomy release at these various B values. And for model outcome, we've used, um, or for model outcome measures, excuse me, um, we've used cat days. And cat days represents the impact of the population on the environment. Um, and that can be represented in this population versus time curve as the area under the curve after the intervention begins. So cat days sits here. Um, and so here's the good part. Um, so results of our study, I just want to orient you to the um, graphs that I'll be showing you. So on our vertical, oops, sorry. On our vertical axis, we've got the cat days. So that represents the environmental impact of the population. Um, and then we've got season on our horizontal axis. So every point represents uh, a particular type of time of the season. So early winter, late winter, early spring, late spring etc. Um, for a particular uh, number of cat days for each method of intervention. So when you get, oops, sorry, let me go back. So for trap probability of 0%, which is um, where you are not trapping any cats and you're not intervening on the population at all, we get this basically a straight line across the entire graph, which is exactly what you would expect to see. Otherwise, our model, there would be something wrong with our model if it didn't look like this when you were doing nothing. And when we move on to trap probabilities that are more in line with what we would see in practice, you notice, we notice a few different trends. So there are three primary take home points that I want people to get from this slide. One of them is that when you look at a trap, uh, the trap neuter release category where uh, the kitten survival rate is 0.6, you see that that always results in the largest number of cat days and also the um, greatest environmental impact. So for every trap probability, that is true. And we also have seen that um, with trap vasectomy hysterectomy release, it always results in the lowest number of cat days and the the least environmental impact of that population on the environment. Um, <clears throat> so that is excellent because that's what Dr. McCarthy had seen in his last study. So it kind of follows, makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, of course, trap neuter release with a um, kin survival rate of, of zero, where that doesn't have an impact on the population um, size, is somewhere in the middle with lethal control. They're actually pretty closely matched at every trap probability. And of course, what this particular study is about is um, when during the year we would like to do these interventions. So it's important that we notice that we, we get this dip in cat days in the late winter and the early spring. So for every trap probability, you see this big dip. Um, and so that results in the lowest number of cat days in the late winter in particular, and also in the early spring. 
But for a trap probability of 97%, um, we noticed that there's a little bit of a different trend, and it's a trend that makes sense to us, I think, because trap uh, re removal or lethal control ends up becoming the most effective because that when you're trapping 90% of the um, population, you would expect that to result in the lowest number of cat days if you were to eliminate all of the cats that were trapped. Um, but trap vasectomy hysterectomy release is not too far behind. Um, and then TNR with a high kitten survival rate is also um, still resulting in the highest number of cat days at this trap probability. So when um, pseudo-pregnant, pregnant and nursing females are left untreated, late winter and early spring are the most efficacious seasons during which to tra trap feral cats living in temperate zones. And we recognize that right now we're at a conference where um, non-surgical methods of control are emphasized. And so we wanted to make sure everyone knew that trap neuter release is essentially equivalent to non-surgical methods of control that don't leave reproductive hormones intact, like GnRH agonist implants and GnRH vaccines. And trap vasectomy hysterectomy release equates to non-surgical methods of control that leave reproductive hormones intact, like the zona pellucida vaccines and anti-sperm vaccines. And we also, once we got this data back, we wanted to try and come up with some explanations for why we see this, um, this result where trapping cats in the late winter and early spring result in the fewest number of cat days. And so in these populations during breeding season, you have a population of pregnant, pseudo-pregnant nursing, and non-pregnant cats. And those cats are having babies, so we've got kitten births here as well. Um, so we, when you intervene on this population, you end up treating adult cats as well as kittens over 42 days of age. And as I said before, kittens um, tend not to survive past six months of age. Um, and so there are a number of kitten deaths that occur um, after they may have been treated already. And so you will have wasted all of these treating efforts and trapping efforts on cats that maybe weren't going to survive anyway. And so ideally, you would like to trap these cats when the population is at its most mature and you have the fewest number of kittens in the population. So during the non-breeding season, which is essentially in late winter or just before late winter, um, these, you have a population of aging and reproductively mature cats. And then when you trap those cats, you, get a lot, you end up treating most of the cats that you trap. And that population is already in decline at that time as well. So you're getting the population when it's at its lowest and its most mature. And so another explanation we came up with was that during the breeding season, like we said, there's this population of pregnant, pseudo-pregnant, and nursing um, cats, but also non-pregnant cats. So you may trap a certain percentage of that population, and that that percentage of trapped cats may, be, may include pseudo-pregnant cats or pregnant cats or kittens that aren't able to be treated. So you've just wasted a whole bunch of trapping efforts on these cats that aren't able to be treated. And ultimately, within that short fr time frame where you're trapping cats, you end up treating fewer cats. But during the non-breeding season, you've got this aging and reproductively mature population of cats. And so when you trap these cats, you can treat most of these cats um, in that seems to be more efficacious. So as with any study, um, our study has limitations. One of them is that we've used a computer model, and that is just a controlled representation of reality. While we can account for as many of these realistic uh, biologic parameters as we possibly can, um, once those parameters are set within the computer, they can't be changed while the model is running. And also, we may not include important parameters um, that do affect the population. We also haven't included immigration or emigration. Um, and of course, that immigration and emigration is always happening in these feral cat populations. Um, we've also not included pseudo-pregnant, pregnant, and nursing cats in our treatment groups. And some programs do treat those cats so in the future, we would like to treat pregnant and pseudo-pregnant cats. And we actually have already looked at this data. Um, but 
even though it follows a very similar trend, the data gets a little bit more muddled and we're kind of still working through that right now. We'd also like to add immigrating and emigrating cats into the model because obviously in normal feral cat populations, those populations are fluid and always changing. Um, and so it's important that we include that the next time we run this model. And we'd also like to investigate multiple annual interventions as well as investigating interventions that included different, different types of methods um, to basically make the biggest effect that we possibly can on population size and environmental impact while limiting the resources that we use. And Dr. McCarthy is here to answer questions if you need. <laughs> it's, it's your presentation. <laughs> Um, maybe I missed it. Any okay. um, theories as to why the trap, uh, vasectomized trap, hysterectomized was more effective than uh, uh, just trap, neuter, right. and, and return? Yeah, so we think that, so this is all in his that previous study that I mentioned, so I can give you that if that's helpful too, but we're thinking that um, in those populations where um, you're, you're leaving those reproductive hormones intact, Cats are more likely to engage in like normal reproductive behaviors and normal um, male male on male aggression, all of those sorts of things. And so it kind of becomes it, it remains just like a normal feral cat population without any treatment essentially. But then when you neuter cats, they become kind of more just neutral and everyone is a little bit happier and um, so there's not as much fighting, there's not as much interaction there's staying in place more often than not. And so we think that that is why, one of the main reasons why. So do you think then that the potential for transmission of infectious disease, such as FIV, from fighting would play a significant role in that? I mean, potentially. I mean, it would I, just I, stay the same. I as think there was a study that was published um, out of, I want to say Brazil, um, that showed <clears throat> in those those populations that were vasectomized or hysterectomized, a much higher incidence of FIV. Oh, interesting. And I, I was just wondering if you thought that might yeah, you know, play I, a role in, in population reduction. Yeah, I can't think of why that would be, but I'll have to take a look at that study. I'm not really sure. Uh, uh, my understanding was because of the, the uh, inner cat fighting, right. because the, uh, the male cats were vasectomized but not, not yeah. neutered. So. And was it any different than like a population without treatment? I don't recall if – I'm sure they had a control okay, population, yeah. but uh, I, I don't recall that. Okay. Thank you. You stole my question, Bob. <laughs> but it's all right. It was only one of the questions I had to. Okay. I guess um, just, just to um, – one comment on your answer, I guess, would be that if those behaviors are remaining and those were the nuisance behaviors the community were annoyed about, just the reduction in cats might not tick the box of success from the community's right. perspective. But anyway, that's yeah. kind of, I guess we that's... We had talked about yeah. that actually right before we got here, okay. trying to explain that. But yeah, I think that the nuisance behaviors would still kind of would still be, be a there. part of those populations. Okay. Um, um, I just, uh, my other question was, um, you included this variable kitten survival mm -hmm. for the TNR, but not the T, not the vasectomy in her... Um, right. So why, why only apply the variable kitten survival to the TNR? I think that we did that just because it was looked at only for TNR in the Gunther study. Um, and also, kitten survival shouldn't play a role in, in populations where there's vasectomy and hysterectomy because it's just the same as whatever the population would be without TNR intervention. I don't know if that makes sense, but like it's the same as leaving the population hormonally intact. And so there's no effect of kitten survival because kitten survival, they're thinking that it results um, from um, that being, it being a more neutral population when cats are neutered um, instead of vasectomized where they're, or hysterectomized where the hormones are left intact. I don't know, maybe Dr. McCarthy can help with that one. But <laughs> so I guess I misunderstood. I thought that the, that the increase in kitten survival was to do with density dependence, but... Give you this so you can so that we can capture it on the 
on the recording, so you can make the explanation on the. <laughs> Otherwise, we miss it on the recording. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's all based on Gunther's stuff from Israel, and she has a poster out here now that sort of looks at that same thing. And so the concept is not density dependent; it's hormonally dependent. So, for, and they have some suggestions for why they think it happens on the poster out here, which I thought was cool. Um, but, yeah, kittens, and again, that's a B equals something when we do this. If B equals zero, we're saying that that's all a bunch of crap and that there is no effect. But um, the idea is that it's a happier population, I think, and the kittens live longer once more and more the adults get sterile. And she talks about that some on the poster out there. Um, and then, I don't know if she's here at this meeting. But, okay. And then the other thing about the TVHR, um, just to add to what she says about the competition, is if you think of a population of 100 cats, if you start castrating them and spaying them, the population that's left doesn't know who's sterile and who's not. Or does know. In other words, once you sterilize a male cat, he's out of the breeding pool. He won't. He has no dominance. He won't breed, right? If you do a vasectomy on him, he will continue to breed. He'll continue to be dominant. He'll continue to fight off other males. And he won't. If you do a hysterectomy on a female, he won't be able to tell that she is out of the population as well. So it basically, creates a giant cluster <laughs> of cats that don't know who's able to be bred, right? So that's one of the main thoughts as far as why it might be better, I think. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Start. So my question would be, has, has any of this research been done actually with um, vasectomized and hysterectomized cats versus making assumptions of the behaviors of cats in a colony that is intact. Um, because I think that there could be um, assumptions, assumptions in the model that are simply assumptions. For example, it may be that, um, I don't know if you've assumed also that there's a, a limited number of male cats who breed any given female cat, and that may in fact not be the case, or that there's a um, guarding effect of the colony that an intact or intact acting male will um, keep the other males away, which may not be the case. And I also, um, I think that many shelter vets may have noticed that, um, or other people working in shelters, that once you get above a certain threshold, no matter what the neuter status of the cats in your shelter are, that you start getting more disease and you start getting more risk of kitten mortality. So it may be that the number of kittens in the colony is actually what is related to kitten mortality as opposed to um, the intact and hormonal status of the adults in the colony. So those are the, the model assumptions I'd like to know more about. They're great, relevant, obvious, true questions. You don't know. I mean, this is the problem with all the computer modeling. You just don't know. Um, I will say that I would argue that a vasectomized, hysterectomized colony should behave exactly the same as an intact colony. That's the idea. And so, and I, I think there's plenty of data that says as soon as you do a spay or a neuter, you improve their health. I think everybody would agree with that. That's part of the main reason why sometimes people are in these programs. So it's hard to argue that you're not increasing their survival and their health, since that's the main reason that many people are doing it. So I think that's probably a given, but all the other stuff is absolutely true. And um, yeah, I think what we need is a clinical trial. And I actually tried to do that. Um, I had a beautiful situation in the British Virgin Islands on Peter Island. And, yeah, we got blown away by Hurricane Irma, and that was the end of that. <laughs> um, I think we can squeeze in those last two people who were trying to ask questions, because this is a topic on which there's lots of interest. So, uh, and I appreciate that, as you say, that you've got to make these assumptions. Oh, by, sorry, Peter Wolf from Best Friends. Um, you've got to make assumptions when it comes to any of these models, and I appreciate uh, the, the items you touched on in the assumptions that went into it, the limitations, all the rest of it. 
I was particularly struck by the, the notion that the, the pregnant cats don't get any treatment. I have colleagues who spend an inordinate amount of time targeting specifically pregnant or ca calico cats. You can safely assume they're female, <laughs> right. In particular times of the year, those cats, again, a tremendous amount of effort, quite the opposite of a no treatment assumption. So I just, could you talk more about that? Yeah, sure. And I think, I mean, that's perfectly valid. I, I think that we should have included those in the model, and we, we did later on. But um, I agree. I think that there are programs that will treat those cats and um, are looking for those cats because obviously they're carrying kittens that, you know, could be born out into the environment. And so, yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, all I can say is that it's definitely warranted to add that into the study the next time because there are programs that specifically look for those animals and are able to distinguish them from non-pregnant animals or lactating animals. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. All right. Thank you. Thank you.